uh, first week. So I <laughs> likely changed my, my talk, so the, in order not to overlap with the Giorgio's talk tomorrow and also with the next talk, uh, which will be focused on prima primarily on reconnections, uh, which I'll be giving next week. So um, this is the outline. Um, I'm going to give an introduction on uh, the, the relevant role played by reconnections in several different uh, uh, physical systems. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, quantum border reconnections, but I'm going to uh, focus on more on the actually on the state of the art. So that would be also an introduction for tomorrow's uh, talk by Giorgio and for the next talks next week. And then I will uh, try to focus more on. Um, how uh, the, um, the fact that when we uh, investigate and we observe vortex dynamics in trapped system, how this differs compared to, uh, uh, to the homogeneous system where most of, the most of the work is fundamentally done also because it's easier, of course, because you get rid of all the complications of inhomogeneity and, uh, and boundaries. Um, then and so I also, uh, given the fact that uh, Giacomo uh, Roati is uh, Next week couldn't make it. I'm gonna um, try to in this in this part in the third part. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you a flavor of the last work we submitted on archive on, which is the vortex dynamics and generation in a Josephson junction. And then, if I've got time, I'm gonna show you um, a work we did a couple of years ago with uh, uh, Gabriele Ferrari in uh, in Trento and collaborators where uh, I show more or less what is the impact of the inhomogeneity and uh, the boundaries uh, in the different vortex interaction regimes that you can have in a, uh, in a trapped uh, Seeger-shaped uh, condensate. Okay. Ah, yes. So, uh, reconnections of uh, coherent filamentary structures, uh, they play an important role in several uh, distinct physical systems. So here you see in uh, plasmas, so in um, where these uh, fil uh, filamentary structures are, um, these one-dimensional filament filamentary structures are uh, magnetic flux tubes or done by magnetic lines. And you see that, uh, for example, the reconnections are responsible uh, for uh, um, an anomalous heating of the solar corona, and it is believed to be beyond, uh, behind the uh, explosive event uh, in the solar and stellar flares. And so, uh, in this case, uh, I have to uh, point out that uh, in ideal MHD, so where there's no resistivity, uh, actually, mm, as in oil, the Euler fluids, uh, the reconnections are prevented. And so all this happens here, uh, all what happens here is because there is uh, some dissipation which drives the reconnection, which allows the reconnection. I'll come back to, to this later. Then also in uh, polymer physics and also DNA, we have uh, uh, the, the filamentary structures here are long chains of molecules, proteins mainly. And here we... Um, so this is the ratio between the core size and the length. So we see that they are mostly say, elongated structure. Uh, and so here there's a dynamics which goes on, which has to, to, to do with topology. And um, it is actually interesting to well, we have to say that in this case, it's not real reconnections, it is strand passages. So actually they, there is a mechanism where which they rec recombine, but it's just like after which they, they continue. So it's not a real reconnection as we intend, for example, in MHD, or in classical and quantum, uh, in quantum fluid. Then we also have uh, some uh, in, the, uh, in optics, when you have uh, this the filamentary structures are uh, lines of zero intensities, and they have been in engineered, they have been potentially engineered, for example, by, Dennis, uh, by Paget Group with Dennis and Barry. And they see here that we are called about what the vortices are, are uh, lines of zero intensity, and all which are phase singularities for, for the light. And uh, you see that uh, also in this case, uh, they, uh, they, they observed the reconnection. Actually, in this, this work, they were trying to avoid reconnections. Okay, then uh, this is a famous paper of 1991, where there is a, a reconnection done in a happening in a pneumatic liquid uh, crystals. And then, of course, uh, there is the reconnection in, uh, uh, in fluids. And uh, so in classical fluids, there are these elongated structures are vortex tubes because the vorticity is a continuous field. While, as we shall, as you, as we shall see, in, um, in quantum fluids, the uh, this, uh, reconnection of real proper vortex line has it, has it, has, as it has been introduced in the, in, the, in the past lectures. So, okay, very quickly, what is the difference between classical and, uh, and um, quantum vortices? So 
Gastrical fluids, um, vortices have no constraints uh, concerning the shape, the size, the strength, and the, the orientation. So we, we can go from vortices in a cup of coffee or to vortices in, uh, in, um, in, pla in, uh <coughs> in the interplanetary structures. And so we see that there is no, uh, uh, no, co no constriction at all concerning the, mm, the, core of the core size. The core size is arbitrary. You set a level of the vorticity, and this is the vortex core. Uh, while, uh, I mean, we as has been said previously, things are uh, quite different in quantum vortices. So I'll go very quickly, and here you, you quantum, vortices, quantum vortices can be um, created by rotation, by temperature quench, so the kibble zurich mechanism that um, David was mentioning today before. And here we have that the, the vortices are topological defects of the order parameter of the system, and so the omega s, as uh, Mark was telling yesterday, is a uh, Distribution, so it's a delta function centered on the on the <coughs> on the, on the vortex lines, which around which the circulation is quantized. So the, the claim here is that uh, instead of uh, reconnecting classical fluid, where we have seen here you have uh, these second these bridges due to secondary vorticity, creating uh, in quantum systems, we could, uh, actually uh, vortex lines are effectively one-dimensional objects, and so the reconnections are well defined, and there are, there are uh, dramatic and isolated um, isolated events. So the claim is that, okay, we will study reconnections in uh, quantum fluid because in a certain sense there it's easier to study in, in, in these systems. Yes, um, in this case, of course, when, when you have a fluctuation, they, they, they fill the core, of course. I'm talking about t all this talk will be focused, thanks for the, for the question, in the t equals zero limit. Still, I uh, can say that there has been some works that, for, for example, concerning uh, some um, uh, short uh, time scale uh, situation like the reconnections, uh, the fact that the fluctuations fill the core, uh, they don't uh, uh, affect, for example, the scaling of the minimum distance. So it depends on what time scale you, you observe. For example, if you observe the motion of a vortex, uh, for example, in a cigar shaped trap where it precesses around the center, so it's a long time scale, and you will see that the vortex will lose energy and will go towards the edges. But if you look, for example, at the reconnections, so which are events which are very, very in short time scale with compared to the other time scale, you'll see that even if the core is filled by the thermal fluctuations, you won't see any difference. So it's a matter of time scale of on which you concentrate. Okay, so quantum fluids, there are several types of quantum fluids. So the, in the in core of neutron stars is thought to be in superfluid states. We've got uh, helium-3 B phase. And then we have the helium-4 and Bose-Einstein condensates. Uh, and I would just point out here that it, it in the, the scale involved are very different, as it was also, uh, as uh, Carl described yesterday. And therefore, we are, we are forced to use different, uh, a different tool, uh, toolbox. So in one case, the Biot-Savart equation, which is integrated uh, thanks to the vortex filament method. And in the other case, the gross pitayevsky equation, which is a valid model at but uh, at t, in the t equals zero limit, and if the Bose-Einstein condensate is, uh, it's in there is weakly interacting and it, um, in the dilute, dilute limit. Okay, I uh, <laughs> will uh, skip all this part, just concentrating on the fact uh, that this is the, the equation which uh <coughs> it's for the velocity, which is the gradient of the phase of the order parameter in gross pitayevsky and so if we take out this. Uh, this term, which is the quantum pressure, we recover, as uh, David told yesterday, a compressible uh, Euler, so inviscid, uh, barotropic fluid. And so um, this is true if we uh, uh, investigate scales larger than the healing length. And so these two things combined together, is a, is we can say that the it is exactly the quantum pressure term which drives uh, the reconnection, which, as we know, in, the in classical fluids, is it is um, they are prevented, are forbidden by the for by some conservation laws like the uh, Helmholtz theorem and the uh, Kelvin theorem of uh, circulation of uh, conservation of circulation. So here is the difference between just the equation of motions, the balance of the momentum for the classical Euler, classical viscous, and the quantum fluids. And so you see that in those, in the when the fluids are in the classical fluids are viscous, or in the quantum or on a on quantum fluid like a Bose-Einstein condensate, you see that. Uh, it is exact exactly the quantum pressure and the viscosity which uh, drive the reconnections. And this means that in both cases, the incompressible kinetic energy decreases. This is the equation for an incompressible fluid. 
And uh, as I will just uh, uh, mention later, this has driven a very interesting debate in the superfluid community concerning the conservation uh, of helicity in, uh, in superfluid flows, because here the helicity, which measures, measures the knottedness of the filaments of the field, is constant because, re uh, also because the connections are uh, um, forbidden and so the topology is frozen. While in these two cases, there has been a debate concerning uh, what is helicity and uh, how it evolves. So finally, okay, for, uh, for uh, um, I think I can we can say now that the total superfluid elicity is zero and stays zero, and then of course we have to see if this is helpful or not for investigating um, the flow topology and the, the flow in general. So quantum vortex reconnections, okay, reconnection, this is the schematic uh, situation where you have two vortices, they approach, they exchange, they ex exchange strands, and they, and, and, they, and they move away. Of course, in, in a way that it is possible to uh, continue the, um, that the, the flow, the circulation can continue uh, its, uh <coughs> its topology. So what do quantum reconnections uh, do in, in uh, quantum fluids? So they redistribute energy among the scales, they distribute also helicity among the scale, they enhance the mixing, they trigger a Kelvin wave cascade, which is then the way in which at t equals zero the, um, the, uh, the energy, uh, the, the incompressible kinetic energy decays, for example, at the t equals zero limit in superfluid helium. It is uh, a way of uh, transforming incompressible kinetic energy in sound, also at the moment of the reconnection, as a paper by Caron collaborated in 2001. And also, it is the, the reconnections are found to be fundamental for the uh, setting up of the Kolmogorov spec spectrum in, in superfluid helium. So, um, okay, so just very quickly on concerning some uh, the state of the art of the reconnection. So we've seen this uh, this morning this uh, uh, picture by the work by Kopik and Levine, uh, Levine, who were the first to confirm the Feynman conjecture, which. Uh, thought about superfluid turbulence as a cascade of reconnecting vortex swings. Then there's been some work, uh, in this case with the vortex filament method by Arts and Develle in 94 and uh, with the gross pitayeski equation by Carlo uh, some eight years ago, that they were trying to uh, see if there was a universal, a universal uh, route towards the reconnection by the formation of a pyramidal cusp which had um, universal properties. Universal properties ma meaning that uh, the angles uh, phi one in this case and phi two uh, were actually independent of the initial uh, initial condition on the initial vortex configuration. So it was claimed here in this work uh, of Arts and Develle that independently of the initial configuration of the vortices, so these are vortices on the same plane. These are vortices on on an angle shifted by 60 degrees, and this is the hop flink. And so it was claimed that as time went by, so as the distance minimum distance d was decreasing uh, between the vortices. Then the angles phi one was equal to the opposite angle phi three, so on the other side. Phi two was equal to phi four, so the opposite one. And that uh, phi one and phi three separately, of course, they reached uh, um, a constant value independent of the initial condition. However, um, so there was the claim of universality. This uh, uh, actually was in uh, in 2001. It was uh, with uh, um, doing a systematic study of a reconnection between a vortex ring and a vortex line, depending on the initial position of the, of the vortex ring, it, uh, it the, the angles have been measured uh, at the reconnection point just before. And what was, and what, what was uh, shown is that actually uh, this, uh, the angles phi one and phi three, which are the, the, the phi one is the top zone and phi two, sorry, is the lower one, it depended on the initial condition. So actually this claim of uni universality was um, yes, yes, GP. So actually, I have to say that if this uh, if this experiment was done between two vortex lines with different initial condition, initial condition they actually found that uh, phi one and phi th and phi two were, were uh, always having the same uh, the same value. So you recover something like this. But in this case, when you have a vortex swing towards a vortex line, it seems that the, the cusp which was created, which is created, it depends on uh, on the initial condition. So the, the claim of universality um, was actually found not to be true. Yeah. 
no, actually, so there is there is some. Um, so first of all, um, so there there is there's an issue concerning the scales. So first of all, is that the um, if you use the vortex filament method, the vortex filament method uh, it, it um, um, doesn't allow to appreciate density variation. Okay, and so it is valid. So nor the not the depletion of the vortex core, not the sound waves, and also the reconnections are have to be made ad hoc. Okay, with another algorithm, and so. In this part here, um, uh, th th there is a <coughs> this uh, this is valid actually. It is not written in the paper nor in the thesis of arts. There is the, the it claims to go very very uh, d delta is the vortex core, so it it they claim that they go to a distance equal to the vortex core, which is uh, w where the w where the um, uh, where the um, the method is, is not valid anymore. In this case, there is conservation of, 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 of energy and momentum, but the thing is that this, the, the total energy is conserved. So you have an emission, the reconnection triggers the emission of sound, and this, as I uh, think uh, George will talk about tomorrow, this gives a different, uh, different impact on, on the geometry. So there is the conservation laws that are general, of course, for the total energy, but for example, in, in concerning the Grospitajewski, the sound which emits, in a certain sense, um, uh, changes the the dynamics uh, depending on the on the initial preparation of the of the system. Okay, so I'll go very quickly um, through this. Then it was it was found that uh, both with the gross pitayevsky uh, simulation in this case and in that case and the vortex filament method, it was found that if you prepare the system in a certain way, you have a cascade of vortex rings, a cascade of uh, of um, of vortex rings which uh, in this case, uh, with Grospitaski, there is a, the radius of the rings emitted are actually uh, they form a geometric progression. So this was found in this way, depending, uh, of course, on the angle of the initial uh, of the initial preparation. Okay, so just I'll just uh, I'll just skip the, then the the next few slides on elicity because it was uh, uh, addressed yesterday by Mark. So these are just some of the papers that have uh, come out uh, lately. Actually, I found out that there is one missing by William is in Irvine's group in 2017, which, has w which addressed the fact that I what is helicity for superfluid and is helicity conserved? So just why this is important, as I said before, is because in classical fluids and in, and in MHD, helicity uh, in, um, in ideal uh, MHD and uh, ideal fluid dynamics, the, the helicity is conserved while uh, uh, because it is triggered by uh, dissipative events and in fact I when you both I um, include the resistivity and viscosity reconnections can occur so what does uh, how does helicity evolve in uh, for example in a classical fluid was solved by I uh, Irvine um, and collaborators uh, two years ago now where they found that actually when helicity is stored in right then the helicity stays in the right and it's conserved while when there is the uh, initially, when the system is, is prepared, if there is some twist, viscosity dissipates the twist, and then once that the elicity is all stored in the right, then it st stays conserved. So I won't go on, I won't skip this part on elicity. I'll just say that it has to do also with knots that um, David did this morning um, uh, tried to try introduce. says that it has been uh, investigated how uh, superfluid knots untie. And this is al always by the uh, William Means Irvine's group in uh, in Chicago. And it was found that um, actually, the, uh, starting from th they did a simulation of more than of 1,500 uh, knots, and they saw uh, they they classified them in terms of the linking number and the writing number, and then they let them evolve. Uh, they, they let these knots evolve. So, like for example, in this case, and what was found is that. Actually, the vortices, the, the knots evolve in a way that uh, to evolve a maximal clear, uh, maximal clear situation. So where all the writing number have the same, uh, have the same sign, so that the crossing number is equal to the absolute value of the writing number. Because when you uh, perhaps have some, yeah. so to, to do the, the writing number or the linking number, you have to you have to uh, define orientation and you have to define when the crossing is positive or negative, and this depends. For example, if uh, when you cross uh, 
the another vortex or the same part of the or another part of the same vortex and to match the orientation of the other uh, of the other vortex underneath you rotate anti clockwise or clo clockwise then uh, the, the sign can be plus or minus in this case it in in the, in, the, in this work very nice work it was found that the the vortex the knots evolves always in order that the all the cr the writing number are positive and why this is important so and once it punches this branch of maximum neutrality then it goes straight to a knotted to a knotted vortex this is because uh, the, the importance of that is because the same uh, dynamic is found for example in uh, dna recombination so this is because of why th this work is particularly important so then this is something i also just uh, will uh, uh, mention and then uh, george will um, address it tomorrow uh, and also i'm going to address it in the with new results next week just to say that so the topic is how during evolution the minimum distance between vortex strands scales with time why because this has, this is something that has to do that can be measured also in other system and so there is some seek of universality so there have been a lot of works in uh, on uh, dimensional analysis analytical results by sergey and robert west experimental observation that was uh, I remember this morning by Pauletti and also recent paper by Fonda and Srinivasan and some numerical simulation with different methods. And so I think that now we can agree that on, on small scales, so on scales which are uh, comparable to the vortex core, where the density goes to zero, we can claim that, that there is a, uh, in quantum vortex connection there is a universal scaling which is t to the half. What happens at larger scales, this is just uh, say an anticipation for next week's talk, that if you do some GP simulation or vortex filament simulation at larger initial distances, and you do it in um, both on homogeneous quantum fluids or in trap system which are ac accessible experimentally, then you see that at large distances, then you have a different several range of scaling, which can go from the limit, which are com inclu mm, say, which go from the two, which are uh, between two fundamental scalings, which is one is the t to the half, which can, which can extend to very far uh, uh, distances, and the linear scaling uh, t to the one. What matters here is the, is the balance between the interacting um, dynamics. So if the dynamics is, is, is driven by the interaction of the two vortices, or if the vortices approach one towards each other because of self-induced um, velocity, which is which is the velocity which can be uh, induced by density gradients in trapped condensate or, it, uh, or in by, um, by curvature or also by the vortex images. But I will address this issue next week. So why it's important, I will now go to dynamics in trapped and confined geometries. So what's important to uh, uh, address uh, vortex dynamics in, in trapped condensate? Well, because first of all, because they are accessible experimentally, and so if one finds uh, or claims or <laughs> thinks to have found something, it's always nice to have the possibility to uh, check uh, with the experimental if the effect that you have that one have found is important, is relevant, and actually happens because the other effects are neg uh, are negligible. And we know that uh, trapped BCs are highly controllable systems. You can tune interaction, you can tune the tra trapping frequencies, the number of atoms. And also recently, uh, I think probably Gabriele will, Ferrari will talk about this next week, uh, there have been very improvement in uh, visualization techniques like uh, stroboscopic techniques which are able to image in a slightly destructive, <laughs> as Vandele uh, uh, was pointing out this morning, so outcoupling 1% of the, of the atoms. And then also they are able to uh, measure uh, the orientation of a vortex in, uh, in a trapped BC. Then also it's important uh, to address uh, vortex dynamics in the trapped and confined geometries because when we have a, a potential which is not constant, like for example harmonical, um, harmonic traps, then the, this implies a density gradient and the density gradient drives the vortex motion. Another important role which is important to clarify is the role of images. So, so the question is can we intend the motion of a quantum vortex in a trapped, uh, in a confined Bose-Einstein condensate near the boundary, can we think of its motion like the motion of a classical vortex in, for example, in an um, in inviscid uh, Euler fluid? So these are the open questions which at least 
my modest opinion, I think that's worth investigating. In fact, for example, if you have a semi-infinite Bose-Einstein condensate, sorry, the condensate lives only here because there the potential is infinite on, on the left side, then a work by Alexander Fetter, uh, Peter Mason, and Natalia Berloff, they show that actually the vortex, so the potential here is zero and it's infinite, so as uh, David was showing yesterday, the density is constant throughout a layer of the order of the healing length where it goes to zero. They found with variational methods, they found that actually the vortex moves exactly as if it, there was an image of opposite sign on the other side of the boundary, uh, but because of the density depletion, the, the, the distance between uh, the image and the wall is not exactly the same as in classical fluid dynamics, but is actually uh, closer by a factor uh, comparable to the healing length. So this, this allows to say that vortex image play a role in quantum, um, in quantum fluids. Also, this was uh, then here we go to non-homogeneous uh, trapping potentials, and so shown also this morning, we know that if we have a, a vortex uh, created, generated in whatever way, uh, off center in, a, for example, in a pancake condensate, it will process around the center. If, coming back to the analogy with classical fluids, if we have, um, uh, for example, uh, an implicit fluid confined in a disk, and we put a vortex point off center uh, in, the, in the disk, we know that it will process also. And this in this case, is not because of the of the trapping, uh, sorry, of, of the inhomogeneity, because in this case the the, um, the fluid is, is incompressible, but it's because there is an image compared to the, the boundary, which is uh, which you can determine with the circle theorem, which says that actually, so if you have a, imagine you have a classical incompressible fluid here, and you put a point vortex at a distance r from the center, then its image of opposite sign, which will drive the vortex, imagine it is positive, in this direction, so the radius of disk is r, so the radius r prime, the distance of the image vortex from the center, will be such that r prime times r equals r square. So in this case, we have a motion of a classical vortex in a disk, in, in, in an incompressible uh, in, uh, Euler fluid in a disk, which is uh, advected by its image. So in a certain sense, very similar to this way where it is the non-homogeneity the non of the potential driving the vortex. So coming back to this, what really are those two different effects, the images or the trapping uh, or the inhomogeneity? Uh, do they add up or do are they the same thing? So more or less, this is the question. So when you have a, when you have a vortex in a cigar shaped condensate, the phase profile, it is not like, uh, it's not like homogeneous, like if you have a uniform, sorry, uh, if you have a, a vortex in an uh, unbounded BC, but the, 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 phase, the, the phase gradient is, is, uh, is concentrated near the boundary. And it will process on an elliptical, um, elliptical trajectory uh, perpendicular to the vortex itself. And so this has been seen by Gabriele's group in Trento. This is also a paper by the MIT sphere line group. So it oscillates elliptically. The same thing if you have a vortex ring in this case, it was a spherical uh, condensate. Then also here you see that this is the radius as a function of the uh, actual coordinate z. And you see that what, what, what the motion is oscillating in this way because of the density, density gradient. So why is this? Why this happens? So the equation of motion of a vortex in, uh, in a trap is given by it is a balance between the Magnus force, which you have because you have uh, uh, an implicit fluid which uh, circulates around the vortex with uh, the circulation. And then you have another force which stems from the fact that the energy of the vortex changes as with its position in the, in the, in the interior of the, of the trap. So depending where it is, the condensate has, um, so the, the energy which the vortex conveys to the condensate and the energy on total varies. And so to find the, the equation, so to find VL, we have to solve this, uh, this equation. So in a homogeneous condensate, um, of course, you don't have this part. In fact, it's a single vortex, it, it's still, it doesn't move. But the energy is, let's say, proportional to the, to, the, to the density. So now if we plot the energy, for example, in a, in a, in a, 
in harmonic trap in a pancake in oblate condensate with different uh, radial frequencies. Or let's no, actually let's let's take a spherical trap for simplicity. So a circular trap, so a disk in 2D, and you plot the energy of uh, of the condensate with the vortex as a function of R0. You have that the energy, just look at the first curve, the others are with rotation. You have that the gradient of the, of the energy is negative. And so that, that, that part, uh, and so this gives you the orientation of, of the vortex as we will see in the, in, in the, next, uh, the next slide. If you've got a vortex swing, the things are different because if you take a, a slice here, this is the energy as a function of the radius and of, of, the, of, of, the, of the Z uh, coordinate of the spherical trap. Uh, here you see that if you take a, a slice, the, um, the energy as a function of R0 has a shape like this. So compared to before to a, to a vortex line, which was like this. So here is a sine inversion. And this is exactly the reason why when you have a vortex line, so if it's you put it in the center, it is still. You put it off center, then it travels this way and it has an ellipsis because the gradient of the, of the energy points into the middle. And so the only way that the cross products give the same direction is going on, on the right in this case. For a vortex ring, it is more or less, it, it, you have two different behaviors. So if it's close to the center, we can imagine that in 2D it, it, is, it feels more the, the other part of the vortex and moves according to its circulation towards to the right. Either if you put it outwards, it flows on the other side. So this is the effect of the density gradient. But as I showed here with the images, actually you can think it all, all also in terms of images. For example, in this case, the vortex uh, feels more, feels more the, the other part of the vortex compared to the images which are with respect to boundary because they are far away. While in this case, the <coughs> this element of vortex feels more the, the image and so it goes to the other way. So these are the... Um, No, no, it yes. they would be a real image, but the, the, if you do it, the, um, the shape will be the same, more or less. So it not, will not be exactly the same. The thing is that they have the same effect, but they are different effects. So, if you, so it, it, it is the fact that if you have also have a uh, density gradient, then the velocity will be different. So they, it's like if they add up in a certain sense. Yes, yes. No, if you do a simul if you, no, it, it is it is like an extra for it is the same if you if you do if you take a, a channel, okay, uh, classic vortex point. So here you have got no fluid. If you have a, a, pa a plus and a minus, they are close. They go here. They are far away. They go the other way. So it's exactly the same way. So in fact, this is what, what, I, what I would like to point here is that you have. Uh, the density gradient and uh, the, the vortex image give rise to the same effect, but they are distinct. So, uh, this uh, so this is just to explain that um, the, the the motion that you s that you've seen before of the gradient of the of the of the energy actually when a vortex moves, so when you create an initial condition with imaginary time, or would be better if if we if, if we did like. Uh, um, Mark Brachet yesterday was uh, was uh, was explaining um, the energy, the variation of energy, uh, depending on where you put the vortex, it is actually only the kinetic energy, especially in the Thomas Fermi limit where the, the core is is very small. So the vortex moves in order to conserve the, the, the its kinetic energy. We can say this is very important. This system. So what we have what what has been done here? So we have done some simulations starting stemming from. This paper of 2018 by the Lenz group, so by Giacomo Ratti's group, which is a follow-up of their first science paper in 2015. So what they do is that they prepare the system with a laser barrier 
uh, where um, in order that to create an initial population imbalance. So actually they shift the trap. And so, uh, so initially the, ba the, ba the barrier is, 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 is put uh, off center. Then they shift the trap to in order to barrier to the the so that the barrier is in the middle. And you have initial population imbalance. So if you do an imaging, you see that this in this case, the number of atoms and so the chemical potential is higher with respect to, to the left. Okay, so what happens here? So we have the Joseph and Anderson relation, which explains that in each uh, separate, with, with, a, with a barrier which is sufficiently high, we, you can imagine that the two phases evolve differently. And so you have this, this is the, the time derivative of the phase in each side. And so if you take the gradient, it takes that the velocity, it, it's, uh, the flow is accelerated with an, uh, with an acceleration which is proportional to the gradient of the, uh, of the chemical potential, which is the same of saying it is accelerated by the population imbalance. So when the, the superfluid uh, velocity is uh, greater than a, a critical velocity, or which is of the order of the velocity of sound, you have a vortex nucleation. Where does the vortex nucleate? The vortex nucleate exactly in the uh, middle plane, but outside the Thomas Fermi surface. So if you do a, a cut in the middle, so in the, the, in the x equals zero plane, this is the condensate. The vortex, in this case, the flow is going that way. So the vortex, vortex ring nucleates here. Yes, sir. So the critical velocity, this is a good question because so the, the nucleation is a local factor, right, in a certain point. But at a certain time to characterize it, you have to uh, base it on the velocity of sound, which, which is based on some density. And in fact, you see that uh, a good criterion, there is a, I didn't show here, but a good plot is when um, the, uh, if you take the um, Thomas Fermi uh, profile without the barrier, okay, and you take the velocity of sound done, um, so the velocity of, uh, of sound taking as density, the average density in the central plane, then you find that a good criterion is that, it, let's say that we call this n average, it's c divided the square root of 2, more or less. Um, so now, now that you have the vortex, the question is what does the vortex do, how does it move, etc. So depending on the width of the barrier, it can penetrate the, uh, the condensate on the left, the, the, the left side of the condensate. And as I was saying before, the important thing is the conservation of its energy. So you imagine that you have the vortex which lives here outside. When it goes into the bulk of the condensate, it is surrounded by a, a greater amount of fluid and this amount of fluid is denser. So in order to concentrate, to conserve its, uh, its kinetic energy, its incompressible kinetic energy, given that the circulation is quantized, the only way that the, the system can evolve is, to, is the vortex ring has to reduce its radius. And it's exactly what happens. So it enters the Thomas, Thomas Fermi surface, reducing its initial radius. And so this is based on the uh, conservation of the kinetic incompressible energy. And here we see that, for example, this is the Thomas Fermi surface with the barrier so going, uh, the, the, uh, the condensate is squeezing the middle. And you see that the effectively, while when it enters the Thomas Fermi surface, the, this, are, this is the semi-axis of the, of the ring, it, uh, it, it rapidly decreases. I forgot to mention that in this case, the trapping frequencies readily are not the same. So what is created is not the ring, but is an elliptical vortex ring. And in fact, what happens, this is the average of the, of the semi-axis. What happens is that when it enters the bulk, its size increases dramatically. So here we have a factor of three or even more. Then this shrinking stops when, uh, when the, the coordinate is equal to the, to the maximum of the Thomas Fermi radius. And here then we have two different competing dynamics. So on one, si on one side, the vortex is elliptical, and so it starts wobbling. And while it wobbles, it emits some sound. And so it loses kinetic incompressible energy. 
But on the other side, it is moving towards, in this case, towards, towards the left. So it is moving towards areas of uh, where the condensate is smaller and when the density is smaller as well. So it has to increase. So you have two different things. It, the vortex swing wobbles, so it loses energy, and therefore, it, 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 it in a certain sense, length is a proxy of energy. So it decreases its size. It would like to decrease its size. While it w but at the same time, it's going towards area of, of, of smaller density. So it has to enlarge. So how long does the vortex survive? Depends on the initial energy. Here we see, for example, uh, a case where the blue vortex has a smaller um, energy compared to the red vortex, let's say, and so it dies immediately. While, on the other hand, with more energy, the vortex continues wobbling. This shadow is the, uh, the two different... Um, so the dark red is the average uh, value of the semi-axis, while this is the oscillation of the, 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 let's say, Rx and Ry, of course, in inverting themselves. And what you see is that it continues towards the end of the condensate, and at a certain point when it finds uh, the... When it, fi when, it, when, it go when it finds the condensate very small because the, 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 um, there is not, an 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 there is not, there is not is isotropy on the radial plane, then it breaks into vortex lines, which is what happens here exactly, and it is what they see in the experiment. They see the breaking of the vortex lines in, uh, into the, the break breaking of the vortex swing into vortex lines. This, in fact, is the evolution of the, of the vortex ring. So you see that it wobbles, it oscillates. Then at that point, the blue vortex dies, while here the other one continues until it breaks. We measured the frequency of the, of the oscillation compared to the wavelength, because these are m equal to uh, Kelvin wave excitation of the vortex ring. And incredibly, it matches with the one derived with uh, when um, uh, with a radius much much bigger than the healing length. Here the radius compared to healing length is 3 or 4, but the actually the, the dispersion relation is much very, um, very good. And so this is the, the axial coordinates with respect to time, and this is the radius of the vortices with respect to time. What you see, what, what can be seen here is that when the vortex shrinks, because it enters the Thomas Fermi surface, the vortex ring more or less is stationary, and then it, this is the average of the semi-axis. Then it starts going with, starts traveling to the left with more or less a constant uh, velocity. Here, the different colors are the different initial population imbalance, and you see that when you go towards the right, you actually have that the, the rings with the uh, created with a bigger population imbalance, they live, mo they live more, they go further away. And this is confirmed by the next slide. So you see that the, so this is the time life. It's increasing with z zero. In fact, you've got that the, if you measure the velocity in the linear, in the linear region for the different vortices, you've got that the velocity is higher for smaller population imbalance, meaning that, in fact, you have with a smaller population imbalance, you have a smaller radius and in fact a smaller energy, because in fact the energy increases with z0. Then if we do, um, uh, just using the Josephson-Anderson relation, everything matches. The frequency of the, the, frequency of the, of the creation of, uh, of vortices is actually uh, given by the initial population imbalance, or the initial difference of the conical potential, and also the number of vortices. So we are quite happy that everything matches. I just, oh no, I forgot to put the slide, okay. I just, okay, <laughs> just wanted to say that um, one last thing here is that the mechanism that produces the vortices is the, is the mechanism which is phase slip, which can, can also be described in this way. And actually when the, when the, um, the vortex is created, you have what is called the back flow. So the flow which, is, which creates the vortex slows down until then, the vortex swings move into the bulk, and then it starts re-increasing and re-nucleating another vortex. How much do I have? Really? Okay, I'll just, ju just go very... So, okay, so this gives me the opportunity to go uh, to uh, tell you what we did a couple of years ago. 
concerning reconnections in confined geometries. So, apart from all the, um, the reasons I explained, be explained to you before concerning why it is important to uh, in analyze, study the vortex dynamics in trapped condensate, of course, we, are, we, can, uh, we cannot neglect and we cannot <laughs> say differently that one thing that uh, pushed us to, to, um, to, uh, to study the reconnection in confined geometries was the fact that uh, g the in the group of uh, uh, Gabriele Ferrari and Giacomo Lamporesi in, in Trento, they have, uh, through the kibble zurich mechanism, they were able to create uh, vortices in a, in a trap. Uh, so they, they have a, a temperature quench, and as was said this morning, the important fact is that they could control how many vortex, on average, they created. This means that they were able to create, more or less, on average, they, 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 they knew what was the temperature quench in order to create two vortices, which was what we wanted. And they also had, at that time, a real imaging of, uh, uh, of, 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 the, of what, happens, what was happening in the condensate, which was this PRL of 2015, which was able to track the axial uh, position of the vortices. And they saw this type of interaction. So it's clear that here you have an orbiting of vortices which when they have the same z, so you have to imagine that in this case, yeah, we have a cigar shaped condensate. This is z. So and this is how the two vortex, uh, the, the axial coordinate of the vortices while they, they travel. And you see in that in this case, when they have the same z like here, actually they continue as it, as it was nothing, more or less. So in this case, it is two vortices of the same sign which travel here and they don't disturb themselves more than certain degree. Here, when they are of the same z, then they lose visibility. Here, there is a phase shift. So actually, we started asking ourselves what, what was going on. So we okay we did the we did some numerical simulations we tracked the vortices with the, the algorithm that uh, Doug De Giorgio and Alberto um, with the same algorithm of, of the same spirit of the algorithm by Giorgio uh, Alberto and Davide, which takes into account the fact that here we are in a trap system so the density goes to zero and so this creates problems in tracking the the vortices near the edges so there is a small correction let's say to the algorithm for homogeneous uh, cases. These are the comparison with the experiments. The biggest fact is that we have got only an aspect ratio of five, and it's smaller because of computational constraints. And of course, we don't take out atoms at each, um, at each step. So the number of, of atoms in our case is constant. We start from two vortices, symmetrically with respect to the central plane, and orthogonally because we wanted to choose a situation which was most three-dimensionally pos three possible. And we investigate the axial coordinate with time, the minimum distance, which I won't talk about, and the relative angle between the central parts of the vortices. Okay, I forget to have, okay. So what we have is that for a minimum distance which is greater than the transverse Thomas Fermi radiuses, the, 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 the motion is more or less like two vortex that go without uh, seeing each other. They are perpendicular, so they they process on uh, orthogonal elliptical orbits. And the important thing is that the outer vortices go faster. Because the, in this case, the trajectory is elliptical and it's only determined by the, uh, or the, or the so-called orbit parameter chi, which is the ratio between the, the uh, uh, semi-axis of the ellipses and the Thomas Fermi radius. And so, till, so for this time here, actually, they don't see each other, they, they go sinusoidally. Then they interact and you see that it, they, they slow down. So what happens here is something, is that when the, the minimum distance is of the order of the tom transverse Thomas Fermi radius, actually the vortices to conserve energy, they have to rotate and to put themselves in an anti-parallel fashion. When they do this, actually, as we know well in a homogeneous case where you have two straight anti-parallel vortex, they start moving, they traveling in, th in this case in the direction of the center. If actually, they reach the center and go past the center, then the density gradients are reversed, and so they bounce back. And so, to give, this is what happens. Here they arrive, and they bounce back. And if you want to see, and from another, this is from the top, you see that they will migrate towards the other side of the condensate, 
and then they will come, they, they, will, they will come back. So actually, we have this is what happens, okay, schematically in 2D. When the vortices are sufficiently close to the boundary, they have a velocity, a axial, say, colliding velocity, which is um, uh, larger because we said that the vortices uh, process faster on outer orbits. So in that case, the axial colliding motion is too fast in order to make, uh, compared to the radial uh, motion that takes them to the other part of the condensate, and so you have a reconnection. When on the other side, on, on the other case, the, the vortices are far away, let's say, from the, from, the con from the condensate edge, so when the orbit parameter is small, then the axial, um, the axial uh, colliding uh, motion is uh, slow enough to allow the radial motion to push the vortices to the, other, to the other side of the condensate, and in this case then, because the density gradients are reversed, or because the images are, uh, are positioned, they, they push the vortices on the other side, you can see it as you want, then, the, then there is the bounce. So, which means that the only thing which matters is the distance from the edge of the condensate, and the distance is proportional to chi. So, what we expect is that we expect to have, uh, with smaller chi, we have reconnections. Uh, sorry, with smaller chi, we have the bounce, and with larger uh, chi, we have reconnections. It's exactly what we see. So, with this uh, uh, chi of 0 0.375, we have a reconnection. Okay, I can show it. Okay, this we, all, we have all seen. Uh, this. So this is a classical reconnection. Okay. When the chi is more than a certain threshold, we have the bounce that I, that I told you before. And there is also an intermediate region which where the bounce occurs uh, via double reconnection. You have a double reconnection and uh, um, One, then the first, and then two. Okay, we're skipping. Then you've got uh, another case where the reconnection between two vortices which are not placed in a symmetrical situation uh, create a smaller vortices, a smaller vortex with a short length and it's on the other side. And so in this case we have what we call an ejection. Because experimentally, and I'll show that our, our results match with the experiments, of course they, they subtract what they see from the Thomas Fermi uh, profile. So when the vortices are outside, there's not much difference between with or without the vortex because anyway the density is small. So in this case, we lose the visibility, the experimental visibility of this vortex. And in fact, if we modulate this, the curves of the actual coordinate with actually the Thomas Fermi density where in the uh, center of vorticity of the vortex, we see that here we don't see it anymore. So, okay, this is the case of the orbiting, which is this, this case here, which pushes the vortex actually outside. Okay, no, so yes, so I, 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 went, I went too quick. So, here the curves here, it is the, the coordinate of the, so we take the vortex and we take its barycenter, okay? And we take the, and, we, and here we plot only the axial coordinate. Then the thickness and the intensity of the color of these curves, they are modulated by taking uh, the, the, the value of the Thomas Fermi density where in this very center of the vortex in order to account qualitatively for the visibility. So if we have a vortex here, the Thomas Fermi density will be high, so you will, you, you will see it, and this is, for example, this case here. When it gets ejected, so towards in this region, the Thomas Fermi density is smaller, and in fact, the, the line you can see it very difficultly. This is in order to account with do comparison with experiments. Exactly. So I mean, we see them everywhere. Of course, experimentally. Exactly. And this is this is this is exactly the sense why we modulated these these plots with this thing with this uh, the Thomas Fermi density at the center, of, say, of, of gravity of the vortex. If we can say like this in order to account the, the visibility of the vortex by, by experimentalist. And so actually, okay, I won't go into the experimental 
also because I'm not an experimentalist. Okay, and so here is the comparison uh, between um, the numerics and, uh, and, uh, and the experiment. And I just want to say that, of course, we put the vortices where we want. The experiment, the experiment, the, the experiment creates the vortices uh, the stochastically with the Kibble-Zwick mechanism. So we don't know where they are. So, of course, they did hundreds of realization. And the only thing I want to point out from the experimental uh, setting is that by, the, um, by outcoupling uh, the, the a fraction of 1% of the atoms, the, this, the colors which appear here, they are able uh, to um, give, uh, important give information concerning the orientation of the vortex. So, if, if for example, if you have um, re uh, green uh, and pink, it means that, in, for example, it points out. When it is reversed, so if you, if in this area, if you have green, pink, on the other side, pink, pink, green, it is goes points to the other side, and then there is a way where you have uh, the three colors, which in this case the vortex is vertical and can point either up or either down. They cannot still dis distinguish this uh, this feature, and so this is important because actually, so with this improved technique, they're not only able to trace the. Um, the axial position of the, uh, the axial position of the vortex in the function of time, but also its orientation. So you can see here that here we have three lines, so it's vertical. And here you, we have only two different colors, so they are orthogonal. And after the interaction, they come out antiparallel, which is exactly the case of the bounds. The bounds we see that they are antiparallel. In this case, it is a reconnection because you have that vortices are orthogonal, but after that. The, 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 um, the slope changes, you change the visibility, and you change also the, the orientation pattern. And this means that there has been a reconnection. This is an ejection by reconnection because you lose the visibility of the other vortex. In this case, because they are parallel and after the interaction you don't see them anymore, it means that there is an ejection by orbiting in the sense that in this case, where two vortex, they travel, then the interaction between between two of them actually pushes one of, uh, of them out. And so you, you lose visibility again. Okay, then these are some statistics uh, experimentally. and see that the rebounds event are effectively seen when the relative velocity, so the orbit parameter is smaller. These are all experimental uh, results. Then you see that the bounds happens more when actually they are antiparallel. And then you see that here in this case with a big orbit parameter, you effectively have an ejection. So the, the experiment, the statistics done on the hundreds of experimental realization match the theory that we gave, uh, the interpretation of what we gave of the phenomenon. Okay, so I'm not quite on time. So just want to, the summary is that, uh, okay, I tried to uh, show what is the importance of the role of reconnection played in different systems, including quantum vortices. And then I, I switched to trap geometries to say that, for example, concerning reconnection, uh, there are novel vortex interaction regime dictated by the inhomogeneity and by the confinement of the system. And also that when uh, there is inhomogeneity, like for example in the Josephson junction, which is strongly not inhomogeneous and the boundaries play an important role, then you can, uh, um, then you can, uh, then there is some interesting dynamics to be uh, still uh, explored. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for your attention.